In this video, I'm going to be describing the Bragg gray cavity theory, which we use to convert dose measured in one medium to dose in another. The relation itself is quite mathematically simple, but in order for it to be applicable, a measurement needs to satisfy a number of criteria, the subtleties of which can be quite complicated. If you're watching this as a non-physics specialist, I'd recommend looking at the equation itself, understanding what it's for, and if you're worried that they might pop up on an exam, just memorizing the Bragg gray conditions as they appear in textbooks. But for physicists, understanding the theory can be quite useful as it can influence the choice of detector when taking measurements, and it's useful for understanding the basics of absolute dose measurement. In order to obtain a measurement of absolute dose with an ionization chamber, we need to convert the measured dose to the air inside the chamber to dose to a point in water. I mentioned in the previous video that we can obtain dose to air from measured ionization chamber charge by multiplying the measured charge by the average energy required to produce that charge and dividing it by the mass of air inside the chamber. The bragg gray theory allows us to convert the measured dose to this air volume to dose to a volume of water instead, and we use something called volume scaling to convert dose to this volume to dose to a point. The bragg gray theory and volume scaling are often lumped together. In fact, you don't often hear volume scaling talked about in the literature at all. Both of these processes only work under the same set of specific conditions, namely that it's secondary electrons that are responsible for depositing the dose inside the ionization chamber, which is true in high energy beams, and some others which I'm going to talk about in a moment. The approach that I just described of obtaining a measurement of absorbed dose to water by converting measured charge to dose to air, and converting dose to air to dose to a point in water, is a little bit different to what we actually do in the clinic. But the principles are the same, and it allows for a more simple explanation of the bragg gray theory. I'm going to be describing how we actually apply it in the clinic in a video on absolute asymmetry codes of practice. We need the bragg gray theory, because if you want to measure dose at this point, all we can really do is put an ion chamber near it and measure the dose of the air volume. Dose is deposited mostly by secondary electrons. At this point in homogeneous water, without an ion chamber in place, the dose at this point of depth would be deposited by these secondary electrons here. When we replace the water below this point with an ionization chamber, so with a volume of air, it changes how these secondary electrons behave. They'll travel further through air than they would through water, and they'll lose a different amount of energy. The purpose of the bragg gray relation is to allow us to use the amount of energy measured in this region of air to work out how much is being deposited at the point at which we wish to know the dose. Here we have a secondary electron crossing our ionization chamber. It moves through a centimeter of water above the chamber, through our centimeter thick chamber, and a centimeter through the water behind the chamber. Let's assume for the moment that the electron loses energy steadily as it travels. The rate depends on the material. So here we'll say that it loses 1 MeV per centimeter in water and 0.5 MeV per centimeter in air. It makes sense that it would lose less energy per distance traveled in air, since there are fewer things for the electrons to hit. And if we know how far this electron is traveling through each medium, and the rate at which it loses energy per distance traveled, we can work out how much energy the electron is losing in each of these three areas. An electron that travels 1 centimeter through the water above the chamber, and loses energy at a rate of 1 MeV per centimeter, will lose 1 MeV. An electron traveling 1 centimeter through the chamber, that loses energy at a rate of 0.5 MeV per centimeter, will lose 0.5 MeV and it will lose another MeV in the water on the other side of the chamber. The bragg gray theory uses this information to answer the question, what if the region of air inside the ion chamber was made of water instead? Well, we know that the rate of energy loss per centimeter in water is 1 MeV per centimeter. So if this region of air was made of water instead, the electron would lose 1 MeV per centimeter instead of 0.5 MeV per centimeter. So it would lose twice as much energy as it traveled that centimeter through the ion chamber, and the amount of energy deposited would be 1 MeV instead of 0.5 MeV. This is essentially all the bragg gray theory does. Writing it out mathematically, if we replace the air in the middle region with water, the energy lost inside the middle region will be equal to the energy lost if it was still air, multiplied by the rate of energy loss per centimeter in water, divided by the rate of energy loss in air per centimeter. In this case, that's the 0.5 MeV lost by the electron in the air, multiplied by the rate of energy loss in water, which is 1 MeV per centimeter, divided by the rate of energy loss in air per centimeter, in this case that's 0.5 MeV per centimeter, this gives a result of 1 MeV. The name that we normally give to the rate of energy loss is the electron's stopping power. So writing the bragg gray equation in a form that's closer to what you'd see in the textbook, the energy that would be deposited in water is equal to the amount of energy that is deposited in air multiplied by the ratio of stopping powers for water and air. When we're actually measuring dose, we know the amount of energy absorbed inside the air volume, since that's what the ionization chamber tells us. And we also know the ratio of water and air stopping powers at our dose point. This stopping power ratio is included in the dissymmetry code of practice. So there are published values that we can get if we need them. These depend on the beam energy or quality, 
So we pick the right one from the tables in the code of practice based on measurements of the beam quality. Say for photons, this is the TPR 2010, or for electrons, this is the R50 value. We can use the equation that I showed you on the previous slide to combine the measured energy in air and the stopping power ratio to give us the energy deposited in water at this point. So the energy deposited in water is equal to the energy that we measured in air multiplied by the electron stopping power in water, so the amount of energy lost per centimeter in water, divided by the stopping power in air. This is basically equivalent to what I showed you on the previous slide. If the electron stopping power in water was 1 MeV per centimeter, and the stopping power in air was 0.5 MeV per centimeter, the amount of energy deposited in water would be equal to the 0.5 MeV that we've measured in our air volume, multiplied by 1 on 0.5, which would give us a value of 1 MeV absorbed in the water. This is about as complicated as math normally gets in radiotherapy physics. It's quite a simple relationship, but where the bragg gray theory gets complicated is working out when this relationship is actually true. There are a few conditions that need to be satisfied in order to ensure that this relationship actually holds true. The first of these conditions has to do with the applicability of the stopping power ratio. We generally know it at one point, thanks to a dissymmetry code of practice and a beam quality measurement. And if it doesn't change very much inside the ion chamber volume, this is all we need. But remember, stopping powers vary with electron energy. So if the secondary electrons crossing the ion chamber don't change energy very much, then this stopping power ratio is going to be the same everywhere inside this air volume. But if it's not, so if the electrons lose a significant amount of energy as they cross this air volume, we can't just apply this simple stopping power ratio to get our dose of water. Energy loss within the air volume depends on the distance traveled through the air volume. The bigger the distance, the greater the energy drop. But if we keep this distance very small relative to the range of the electrons, then any change of energy is very small as well. So we can assume that it's negligible. So one of the key bragg gray conditions, the things that need to be true so we can apply that formula that I just showed you, is that the chamber volume needs to be small relative to the range of secondary electrons produced by the beam we're using. If this is true, then we can use a simple stopping power ratio to convert dose to air to dose to water. An ion chamber allows us to determine how much energy is absorbed inside its air volume, or dose to air. The bragg gray theory allows us to convert this dose to the air volume into dose to a water volume. But how do we convert dose to a volume to dose to a point? Here we have a similar setup to what we've seen before. A centimetre thick ion chamber air volume with a stopping power of 0.5 MeV per centimetre, within which an electron loses 0.5 MeV. We're going to move from discussing energy to absorb dose. So let's say for now that this air volume contains one gram of air. If we divide the volume in half along this line, it's half a centimetre thick. And it still contains air, so the stopping power is still 0.5 MeV per centimetre. So the energy lost by electrons traveling through this first half of the volume would be 0.25 MeV. And also, if the ion chamber volume contains one gram of air, if we divide in half like this, each half will contain half a gram of air. Now remember that dose equals energy absorbed per unit mass. So the dose in our one centimeter thick air volume, which contains one gram of air, will be 0.5 MeV per one gram of air. The dose in our half centimeter thick subdivided air volume would be the 0.25 MeV absorbed divided by the 0.5 grams of air inside the volume. If we divide it in half again, the electron would only travel 0.25 centimeters through the air volume, and losing energy at a rate of 0.5 MeV per centimeter, it would lose 0.125 MeV, and the mass of air in this region of the ion chamber volume would be 0.25 grams of air. We see here that each of these get the same result for the dose. It's all 0.5 MeV per gram. The dose within the 1 centimeter volume is equal to the dose inside a 0.5 centimeter volume, which is equal to the dose inside a 0.25 centimeter volume. Since the energy absorbed inside the volume changes at the same rate as the mass of air inside the volume, the dose does not vary with the size of the volume. This holds true if the energy absorbed is the same in each part of the chamber volume, so if the stopping power doesn't change across the chamber. What this means is that no matter how much we move the back wall of the chamber towards the front here, the dose won't change. This means that for an ion chamber of this shape, we can infer that whatever dose we obtain inside the ionization chamber volume will be equal to the dose in water just at the front wall of the volume. This will be an average value across the front wall. But if the dose distribution across the chamber is uniform in this direction as well, we can volume scale in the other direction too, and infer that each point on the front surface of the chamber will be equal to the dose that we measure in the ion chamber volume. So we can assign our measured dose to this point. We've discussed the need for the energy of the electrons and the stopping powers to stay constant across the ion chamber air volume. The other bragg gray conditions can also be understood based on their impact on volume scale. If we have an ion chamber air volume with two electrons passing through this time, they both travel one centimeter through the ion chamber and lose 0.5 MeV per centimeter as they travel through. This gives us a total measured energy of one MeV. 
I should point out that I haven't used real stopping powers here, I've just made up easy ones to illustrate my points. If we apply the bright gray relation here, using a stopping power ratio to convert energy absorbed in air to energy absorbed in water gives us a value of 2 MeV. If we calculate the dose, assuming that there's 1 gram of air inside the ion chamber again, we get a value of 2 MeV per gram. And since the energy absorbed in the air volume is constant throughout the chamber volume, we can use volume scaling to relate this measured value to a point on the front window of the chamber. Now let's look at what happens if the energy absorption isn't uniform inside the chamber. So if one of these electrons was to stop halfway through, the dose at this point that we just calculated will still be correct. Since both of these electrons will still be passing through these depths and depositing 1 MeV per centimeter traveled, so the energy deposited here would still be 2 MeV. But the lower electron here is now only traveling halfway through the chamber, so it travels 0.5 centimeters through, and as a result deposits only 0.25 MeV inside the air volume. This gives us a total measured energy inside the chamber of 0.75 MeV. If we substitute this value into the equations on the right, with 0.75 MeV being the energy absorbed inside the chamber air volume, converting this to energy absorbed in water gives us a value of 1.5 MeV. And converting this to dose, assuming that there's 1 gram of material inside our ion chamber, we get a total dose of 1.5 MeV per gram. And you notice that if we try to volume scale this with a non-uniform energy absorption across the ion chamber volume, with it being lower in the second half and higher in the first half, our dose to a point on the front wall of the chamber is wrong. It's 1.5 MeV instead of 2 MeV. So in this case, applying the Bragg-Gray relation and volume scaling gives us an incorrect value of dose to water. This sheds a bit more light on the reasons behind the Bragg-Gray conditions, specifically why the thickness of the air volume, D, must be much less than the electron range. Because if it's not, you'll get electrons stopping inside the chamber volume, and we'll see this effect that gives us an incorrect result. This is also why we don't want any changes in electron energy deposition within the chamber as well, since if it's higher in one part of the chamber than in another, we can't accurately apply volume scaling. So the electron range must be much, much larger than the dimensions of the chamber. Electrons shouldn't stop inside the ion chamber as well, and we don't want any electron energy changes inside the chamber either. Otherwise, the Bragg-Gray relation combined with volume scaling will give us an incorrect result. The next Bragg-Gray condition states that there shouldn't be any photon interactions inside the chamber. The measured energy should be entirely due to secondary electrons crossing the chamber volume. Let's have a look at why that's the case. If we have another measurement geometry like this, so electrons traveling through the water above the ion chamber are losing energy at a rate of 1 MeV per centimeter, we can assume that one electron will deposit 1 MeV per unit mass here. Plugging everything into the Bragg Gray equation again, we see that the 0.5 MeV absorbed inside our chamber multiplied by the stopping power ratio of water to air gives us a value of 1 MeV. And if we volume scale that, we see that the dose here would be 1 MeV per gram. So this dose of 1 MeV per gram is our true value. It's what would actually be deposited in water if our chamber wasn't there. But what happens if a photon interacts and produces another secondary electron halfway along the chamber volume? This other secondary electron travels 0.5 cm through the volume. And given the stopping power in air, it loses 0.25 MeV. Therefore, the energy that we measure in the air volume will change from 0.5 MeV to 0.75 MeV. If we plug this into the bright gray relation, and assume again that we have 1 gram of air in the chamber volume, we now get a measured dose of water of 1.5 MeV per gram. If we apply volume scaling, we can once again associate this dose with the front wall of the chamber. We see that this dose is higher than the true value of 1 MeV per gram. So if photons interact inside the chamber volume, the bright gray relation will give us incorrect results. So if we want to apply the bright gray relation, the energy that we measure inside our ion chamber has to come entirely from secondary electrons generated outside of the chamber in the surrounding medium. I've never seen a textbook that does this, but all of these conditions can really be grouped into one. That electrons shouldn't change as they pass through the chamber volume. That means they shouldn't change energy, and there shouldn't be any change in number due to stopping or due to photon interactions. In megavoltage beams, ionization chambers fit these conditions fairly well by having small volumes filled with air which has an extremely low density, so it doesn't take much energy from electrons as they pass through. And in megavoltage beams, it doesn't absorb many photons either, 